about the independent spirit of the, the filmmaker and we'll get a little bit more to, into that uh, what I call the special duende of every artist. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes people ask, uh, where does your creativity come from? And uh, <clears throat> I don't think it's anything extra special that uh, I have a goblin or a gnome or a, or a duende in me that, that I believe all of us have. And it's just up to us to discover our little duende in us and then start creating by giving a voice to that duende. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the fact that um, it was just a few months ago that I was homeless. <laughs> After the art fair, um, I had another version of this um, Installation downstairs. It's called World War Three, a, a culture war. And I've always believed that World War Three will not really be about the missiles between Trump and Kim. That's already a thing of the past, but I hope <laughs> you never can tell with these guys. <laughs> Their whims are uh, well. If it's a playful duende, maybe it won't be such a bad war after all. After my first um, film Perfume Nightmare came out in 1977, uh, it was beyond my expectations. Imagine my first little film exploded at the Berlin Film Festival in 1977. I think many people here were not yet born then. Um, and it was my first attempt at filmmaking. I had not gone to film school, but I guess the primitiveness of that film um, must have shocked people. Um, it's like, hey, where did that, what planet did that film come from? So that shows that maybe my duende had touched a lot of uh, <clears throat> curious souls um, <clears throat> and my storytelling methods were talagang galing sa ibang planeta nobody had seen any kind of a uh, even up to now when I look at that film it's 40 years since that film 41 this year uh, <clears throat> I ask myself, hmm, did I really make this film? I mean, uh, there's something cosmic in there and I can't believe that I, I did that film on my own. I must have been playing ping pong with somebody somewhere. And I think because that was a good partnership, it became a very interesting game, you know? And while I was making that film, I was also learning to play ping pong. <laughs> or learning to play the yo-yo, in a way. <clears throat> so my second film was this film, uh, Who Invented the Yo-Yo, Invented the Moon Buggy. Because for those of you, have, have most of you seen Perfume Nightmare? Okay, uh, that was in the series. Uh, I think it was shown a couple of times, no? Uh, <clears throat> Perfume Nightmare is about some, a, a Filipino jeepney driver who dreams of going to the, becoming to America to become the first Filipino astronaut. Okay. Um, and I, I think it's a metaphor for a, a lot of us. This country has been so um, raised, let's say. Uh, I, I like to think of our public education system as a, a child-rearing practice. <laughs> we have all been brought up to admire um, America. And there's, there are a lot of things to admire about America, but I think we've a little bit overdone our awe. We have a little bit overdone our American idol. 
and because of that uh, sometimes maybe we have become also a copycat culture I think if there's any mission if I might say I might have a mission I just like to hold a mirror to everybody our, our young artists and say let's let's take a deep look at our creativity and are we being limited by the fact that we have had this colonial education um, <clears throat> which up to today uh, keeps us in awe of certain idols um, which uh, for better or for worse sometimes keeps us locked in a uh, locked in a certain kind of expression but I think I think in recent years, like, I really see a lot of um, original, very, very original duendes at work. Um, there's a whole big crop of uh, young artists who are challenging, challenging the borders, no? Um, I remember in 2005, I was in the Venice uh, Art Biennale, and the theme of that Biennale was always a bit further, always a little bit further. Talking about the artist just going a little bit more, making that yo-yo go a little bit farther <laughs> to uh, let that, to challenge the, uh, the format, the, the style, the borders that are, <laughs> and parameters that have been, have been, um, determined by yeah, the evolution of art. Huh? And if we are, I think America, because of its nature, is also a very creative country. I mean, <laughs> creative not only in art, but also in atomic bombs and <laughs> missiles and, and military hardware. But um, its unique history maybe allowed them to play that role. And I think it's And I always feel that our creativity has to really start with something that is from home, no? Galing sa sariling ating fertilized grounds. If we, uh, <clears throat> if we want to have a claim in the world art scene, I think it's it's partly combining techniques and uh, materials that we pick up from outside. I mean, like film. I, film is really something that we picked up from abroad. No? Okay, there's that physical strip of celluloid, that piece of spaghetti. And every time you make one cut, there were 36 movements. 36. So you. You put the film roll on the on the editing table. In those days, the editing tables were called flat beds, no? Because the lack of talaga parang kama talaga. You put your film roll there, and then you spool it, and then you put it into a take-up reel. Then you advance it zzz, until the point where you're looking for. When you find the exit point, you pull your wax pencil, you mark an X, and then zzz, you go back and forth until you find the entry point. Zzz, you retreat it and then you cut where you put your wax pencil marks. Chick, chick. And then you hang that piece on the trim box. There's some nails. And then you close this roll and then you rewind. Tapos, hanapin mo yung the film that you're already editing. is on a, on a separate reel. You put it on again on the on the spool. You spo I mean, you spool it. Uh, and then you take it to the point where you want to insert the shot. You open the the film there. You pull the trim, and then you glue it together with the entry point, and you test it. That's 36 movements, physical movements. Like developed muscles in those days. <laughs> now everything is click and drag. <laughs> yeah. Then you just you can delete it. you can delete that order afterwards. 
it's so much easier but at the same time I think because sometimes it's so easy wow baka you try 200 versions until you're so great you, you, you don't know which version fits your taste no? okay I, I resisted video for a long time no? um, not because I'm a snob or you know sometimes artists can be I really resisted film because because all my investments were in my film equipment. No, I had a, I had a flatbed. I had a 16 millimeter camera. Uh, I had the sound transfer, but most of all, it was for course force of habit, right? Because nasana ka na dito sa using all this film and 36 movements for every cut. Oh, suddenly you just have to use one finger. My gosh, you, I think you, you develop a nostalgia for for those 36 movements. That's why a lot of the filmmakers would say that I miss the tactile experience that, that, that you used to have when you had the um, um, film. No? But anyway, that's all. Kanya-kanyang online and discard it. It's not really important in the end. You're telling a story, and the way you tell your story is much more important. It's related to um, what I call your sariling duende, our sariling duende. No? Lahat tayo may, for lack of a better word, duende. A creative, playful, impish, little creative spirit inside us. You know, actually, duende is even a, a colonial word. No, it's it's a Spanish word. So maybe we could use the word mutia or or, or something closer to a home. But anyway, for lack of a better word, since anyway, we talk about yung duende ng bato, yung duende ng gubat, yung duende sa loob ng bahay. You know, it's it's uh, it's 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 localized enough uh, as a metaphor for people to pick up that what I'm trying to express. Um, just, let's call it a kind of an energy, no? Okay, uh, uh, I think you have to discover just the nature, uh, discover your duende and try to decipher your nature, yeah. What makes my duende tick? What makes my duende, if I'm a painter, play with this kind of colors? that makes me want to use dry brush rather than whatever, or that makes me do landscapes instead of uh, portraits. Um, your duende develops a certain taste and a certain style, and over the years, um, let's say, it, it's, it's the voice. In duende mo may voice, may voice, yeah, that you have come to enjoy Parang kaibigan mo na yung duende mo. And your storytelling. And when I say storytelling, it's not just as a filmmaker. No? I think all artists have some kind of a story to tell. Whether it's on a canvas or in a sculpture or in a play or in music. No? Yung, that expression is the voice of your duende. I guess some of you have read a little bit about Kidla Um Before, 40 years ago, I was, I was an economist. <laughs> I wore a three suit. I had a valise. And maybe um, if I had stayed on that track, maybe. I would have been part of the 2008 Wall Street crisis. <laughs> One of those guys who quickly made money at the expense of the rest of the world. But somehow, uh, in, the er uh, in the late 70s, no, early 70s, I was already feeling uncomfortable as with my economist job. Economists talk about 
sa Paris, I was working in Paris as an economist at the OECD. Thank you. And um, OECD is like a like the World Bank. It's it's an economic organization of European countries, or no, not only European, but the rich countries who coordinate their economic policies, their trade flows, their aid flows to the third world, no? And I wanted to go back to what I did as an undergraduate student. Nung nasa UP ako, I was a speech and drama major. Uh, along with Ben Cervantes and Lino Broca, we were magkabatch kami. No? We were all supposed to be graduates of class 63 sa UP. So I wanted to go back and I was writing a play, but I could never finish my play. I said, I have to find a way to get out of my job so I can have a sabbatical for two years and write my play. It's even a nice play when I think about it. <laughs> um, which led me to, I needed to support myself for two years, so I had no savings. Noon. So I said, okay, I need to make a windfall. I've, I heard about the Munich Olympics, no? and the Munich Olympics is a chance for me. You see, every Olympics, there is a logo and there is a mascot, a cute little national animal, which they allow businessmen to exploit. But you have to give 20% of your costs to the Olympic Committee. So that's how they made money. That year, that was the Munich Olympics, 1972. They're, they had the Olympic dog. The the sausage dog, that long dog. Okay, that, that's the national animal of <laughs> the Germans. Uh, it's like uh, the American Eagle was the symbol during the Atlanta Games. That was uh, the Russians had Misha, Misha the Bear. I guess the, the Aussies had the, the kangaroo. But that year it was the dog, so I proposed to make it in Capiz shell. No? Most businessmen would say they'll print it on t-shirts, they'll They'll make keychains, any kind of conceivable kitsch that year. So I said, I'll make mine out of cuppy shell with 25 little pieces hanging under the dog. And when the wind blows, clingle, clingle, clingle. Nice, really nice sound. So the Olympic Committee liked it. They approved my product. And I arrived in Munich with 25,000 dash ones. <laughs> with the official Olympic, Olympic colors and official logo on it. Anyway, for the first week it was selling very well. I was, I was bringing them to shops, they were getting new orders, and I said, wow, I think I'm going to be able to get my dream, because for me I was just seeing this as a bridge to, to quit my job so I could become an artist. No? And that's when I said, ah, I think I'm gonna make it. The profit I would make, I, I just needed to make a small profit, about three or four thousand dollars, and then I could, I could hide away for one year in, in some farm in Norway and, and write my and finish my play. But in the middle of the Olympics, wow, fate, Olympics, postage crisis. No? You all know about that, Munich was that when they had the games when the Israeli athletes were taken hostage by um, some militant Arabs and uh, and because the Germans chose to uh, treat it with the, you know a lightning strike a blitz <laughs> a blitzkrieg it failed and it ended up in a massacre everybody all the athletes and the so that, that really shocked the whole world. And I was there in Munich when it was happening. All these helicopters. I was facing the Olympic Stadium, selling my wind chimes. And behind me was the uh, athletic uh, 
dormitories for the athletes from around the world. And you could just hear this helicopter. It's like the soundtrack of Apocalypse Now, you know. <laughs> and nobody knew what was going on. We just heard about back and forth all these helicopters. And only the next day, when the athletes had been killed, that we realized it was really. Anyway, they, they stopped the Olympics for one day and then they resumed and everybody could use the same tickets they bought with the one day later thing. But that was the end of my one and only business uh, venture. At the end of the Olympics, I was really bankrupt. I, I, uh, and I was stuck with 8,000 dogs. <laughs> the thing is that it was uh, qualitatively for me, it was I lived with this uh, commune. There was a film student who was doing crazy films. I was helping him with whatever, whatever uh, projects he had. I learned to, to use the Bolex 60 millimeter camera. And, uh, and also in that commune, I met my wife, who was a painter. And I met my son, who was not yet there. But <laughs> <laughs> but waiting to be called out into this planet. Uh, and I think, okay, I, I, in the midst of all these uh, German and some of them were, there were also some Brazilians and other, in the midst of this, I could see all these people were letting go, uh, what later I would think I had to let go and to, but first I had to discover my duende. So, um, my duende, if I can best describe it, it's, it's my little creative esprit. Uh, that has a unique, it's an esprit that has a unique frame of the world. Okay, we all frame the world somehow, right? We all see an event, we see a, uh, a scene, we see a, uh, a person, and we frame it with our duendes frame. Our duendes frame is very subjective, okay? Because the duende natin sees the world from its, with its own filters. Now, what are the influences of the sa duwende natin. Uh, just think of the duwende as yeah, parang uh, an inner spirit within you that frames the world in a certain way. And that framing comes from for me two major things. No? Yung una, it comes from your unique upbringing as a child. Um, so, for example, your your father was a military man, fascist. Two plus two is that five? Mm, mm, something because two plus two ah, is that five? Ah. <laughs> I hope I hope you don't have a father like that. Anyway, or as a contrast, let's say you have a father who's very artistic and. Ay anak, baka naman 2 plus 2, baka naman hindi 5. Let's just tingnan natin kung saan pupunta yung 2 plus 2, okay? <laughs> so these kinds of ways you've been raised in your personal way already affects the way you're framing the world, no? If you're also raised in a puritanical uh, setup or you're in an ultra-liberal, these are factors that will affect how you see people, how you judge people, or how you find people or incidents interesting enough to write about it or to, to make a film about it or to paint it. The other major factor that affects your duende is the culture you grew up in. And um, yung kultura mo, let's say, yeah, if your culture, you grew up in a village in Ifugao and uh, you're used to seeing people wearing a bahag, a g-string, 
So it's natural. You see, uh, you see somebody with bag, and you even notice how sometimes they say the way the bag swings. You you can even tell who the person is, make a, a characteristic swing. But maybe if you grew up in a uh, Forbes Park, a village called Forbes Park, and you're uh, every day driven in a Mercedes Benz to your school, and you've never seen anything, and, and then suddenly you see a people go walking in the streets. <laughs> you get the poetic uh, view of the, the poet, <laughs> but all these are just. These are just examples that when you combine your cultural factors plus your personal upbringing, you will frame the next person to you will frame something or will frame Kidlat Tahimik very differently from from other people. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Because it has a way of framing the world, that's what you want to share. How to make your frame interesting to your audience or to, to the buyer of your of your canvas or for people to buy tickets to watch your film no? so in a way all this uh, duende is, is not really anything so big mysterious right no? i think when i first started talking about it, i could see people trying to imagine oh, okay, it's like a harry potter thing <laughs> Say a few magic or when the smoke comes up and then you are creating something. No, this is really, it's in us. And I think that's why I want to say that in a way, the Filipinos are one of the most creative people in the world. We have really such playful duendes. If we really let our duendes dance and play and sing, I think. We're, we're going to be the, we're going to be the race of the future. We are the race of the future anyway. I still believe that. For example, okay, the that installation outside. No, um, I grew up in Baguio. I was born in Baguio. I grew up in Baguio. So I had all these wood carvers around me. Of course, they were doing very touristic kitsch like a uh, man in the barrel. <laughs> uh, things that would just sell, they would be re repeating it. It was they 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 were never they were not really given artistic challenges to but uh, so Medwen probably likes wood likes wood carvings. I've seen wood carvers work with their things. My, my playmates were, were wood carvers also. So that's what, that became one of the elements that I would put together in my in my installation. Um, you, have you, you have all seen the installation downstairs? Okay. Um, the two major characters there are the goddess of the wind of Ifogao in Abyan. You see her; she's she's really blowing and blowing with all her might. And uh, that's from the legends in uh, the Ifugao. Uh, in Abyan is the goddess of the wind. The stories that she was weaving uh, a bahag, a g-string, and while she was weaving, she was she was weaving with a backstrap loom. No? The strings are tied to, towards the tree, and she stretches it with her backstrap loom. And the gods wanted to play with her. They started blowing her around. But because she had their backstrap loom, para siyang may seat belt, so she survived the test. No? So the gods were so impressed. Wow, galing, galing. So they were impressed by her, and they made her goddess of the wind. So whenever there's a typhoon, papuntang Ifugao, ayan, talagang lahat ng mga tao, they nagdadasal kay Inabyan. Sana baguhin mo yung direction ng ng daloy mo, don't hit our vi village, or please uh, to tone down your winds, whatever. This is the kind of um, uh, story that I I picked up because I've been adopted by a Ifugao village um, 
in the last 20 years. So that's the goddess of the wind of Ifugao. And then you see a very familiar icon on the other side, the goddess of the wind of Hollywood. <laughs> and now you know where the wind is coming from. It's not from the subway. In the, in the film, there was a subway gust. In it. But now it's from Inabian. So that's the Hollywood influence on Kidlat Tahimik. There's the Ifugao influence on Kidlat Tahimik. And maybe I put them together into one frame and make it a statement about hey, we have, as an indie filmmaker, I want to try to break away from that Hollywood formula. So if I would put a thought bubble on that thing, you would say, in a beyond blowing. Alice Jan, Marilyn Monroe, we have too much of Hollywood culture, stay away. Let our own local film stories grow on its own. We have a lot of talent, we have a lot of, we have a lot of duendes who are willing to tell stories. So why should we become captive? Why do we have to be prisoners of your, of your sex and violence formulas that uh, in the malls, in the TV, it's always the same story, just a rehashing, but as long as there are elements of ta -ta 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 or, or a lot of smooching and everything, it's everybody feels they got their money's worth, even if television is free. <laughs> because my films are very personal. Uh, you, you, you'll see a lot of me in my films. <laughs> Besides the fact that I'm the cheapest actor available. <laughs> I, you'll always see me in my film. But it's also, I think, a part of my dynamic. My, my duende feels more comfortable when I'm directing myself. And I think maybe that becomes uh, yeah, a signature even in my works. But uh, I didn't know it was going to take 35 years to do that film from start to finish. I started the film in 1979. And then, about 10 years into the film, parang, paano ba ito? Parang, anong next na gagawin ko? I, I wasn't sure because, of course, I needed some money. I thought maybe I'll, I'll stop for a while and, and, and try to find some Indonesian boat builders who will, but I have still raised some money to get those Indonesian boat builders to build the boat. Uh, maybe I needed time to let my story develop so that my duende could ping pong ideas with itself and decide how I was going to tell the story of the first circumnavigation of the globe. Um, well, the main thing that I, the main reason why I stopped doing the film in the 1983, or not 84, 85, was because my, my kids were growing up. Young, Silakidlat, Kawayan, and Kabunyan were just becoming very interesting personalities, so I could ping pong with also. And I said, I don't want to miss this opportunity. I mean, I think a lot of us sometimes realize that hope. Oh, is this the little guy I carried? And then suddenly, you're going to marry who? <laughs> <laughs> or you're, you're getting a PhD in what? Nuclear physics? <laughs> Um, we have the, all these kinds of surprises because sometimes we miss that. And I decided, and up to today, but I stopped for 10 years and I thought I could come back after 8 or 10 years to, to resume the film. But as fate had it, uh, I didn't know how to go on. My, my main actor, my main Magellan died. <laughs> um, I was not sure of the next step, so I said, I just have to wait for my duende to get, get energized and do its thing. Tan 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 taran, tan ta tan, tan ta tan, tan taran. Tan 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 taran, ta 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 tan, tan taran, ta 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 tan, tan tan. Tan 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 
tan ta 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 And now, have you completed his PhD requirements for a doctorate in blockbuster filmmaking? The University of Hollywood hereby confers this PhD summa cum laude to Kidlat Taimik. After 35 years, ito na! I have cut my precious reward and now I can go home to my rice terraces in Ifugao and start a blockbuster film industry! Ayan! Magkakaroon na ng livelihood, we can have economic development, we will make it to the 10 top ASEAN countries na may GDP over X uh, $2,500 per capita. Imagine progress, my boy, progress. <laughs> and not only did the University of Hollywood give me this beautiful diploma, my passport to my livelihood project, the University of Hollywood even found financing, financing for my dissertation script, Sex in the Terraces. <laughs> okay, Mama, Mama, here I come. It's enough. It's enough. Ah, the beautiful rice terraces of home. Hindi ka nagbabago after all these years, like you were 3,000 years ago when we discovered the gift of God, rice. Yes. Ayan, mag-uumpisa na tayo ng livelihood projects. Mama! Mama! Hando ko sa iyo. Hindi na kakailangan magtrabaho ulit. Not a single day more of planting or harvesting. Mama, your sacrifice is at last rewarded. Can you imagine? On my way here, on my way here, I stopped in Japan and I was able to get financing for the next sequel, Godzilla in the Terraces. And we're also going to get financing for Rambo in the Terraces. <laughs> Ma, that's how you work formula. Paulit ulit lang, the background. Look, Rambo in the Terraces. We don't know who's Rambo, Nana. Rambo, just imagine our green, green terraces. And helicopters going up. And now, each green terrace has planted the newly palai turning red with Hollywood ketchup. <laughs> with Hollywood ketchup. <laughs> Ma, I know all the tricks. They taught it to us. It won't be so hard. Huh? Sinabu ko yun 30 years ago when I left to study filmmaking at UP. And when I went to study MBA at Wharton, at the University of Pennsylvania, and later to get my PhD at the University of Hollywood. I said that 35 years ago, I would come back and make films about the hood hood epic chants of the Ifogaos. But I would make films about Inabian, the goddess of the wind, who taught us how to have harmony with nature and respect uh, nature goddesses that I would make a film about the great engineering skills of our rice terrace carvers who made these rice terraces 3,000 years ago 
without a single cent of U.S. aid. But Mama, who will buy tickets for those films? Kailangan may sex and vile. Well, maybe some of these people here will buy, but might just let me do one blockbuster. And then we can do this cultural act up. Huh? Ma, I haven't forgotten the Ifugao beat. Alam ko pa yung yung tuktuk natin noon pa. So busy in the library studying the sex scenes of uh, Lolita. <laughs> <laughs> stories in those old days. How did we tell stories without the technology of Sony? How did we tell stories without the Mitchell high-speed camera of Hollywood and the reflex of Germany? Hey! Papa Lopez, no yak! Paano tayo how did we do it? Huh? We did it our own way? That's simple. We don't need to depend on all that foreign technology. We have the genius of our indigenous local technology. <laughs> Aha! The secret to our telling our own indigenous story! The story of Inabian, goddess of the wind, and how she resisted Hollywood sex and violence films. Who wants to play and come tomorrow to the auditions? Who will play Inabian? Boots. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come tomorrow. Come wear your tapis and come topless. <laughs> Blockbuster industry, hey, blockbuster. He's not blockbuster, but that our our myth, our mythbusters of those superheroes, <laughs> of superheroes that palayin lumalabas sa malls. Maboy ang ati mga kwentong katutubo. Long live our own local stories and our own local history. 
And I like to round out my talk. I always tell people when you're shooting a film, talking heads is boring. And I think I was getting ready. Uh, getting ready um, over blah blah. But anyway, that plus a little bit of film, plus a little bit of my academic theory about <laughs> how the Sarilin Duende comes into existence <laughs> with your blessings. <laughs> so um, let's throw the f let's let you participate now. Um, anything that you would like to share or questions or tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, this one's for you. We live in the age of YouTube, an age where anyone can start filmmaking. What is your opinion on that? I think it's great that everybody can become be, let her do and speak. It has democratized. I mean, the the, the new technology, your your GoPro is that it, and all these cameras have made it so easy for anybody to try to tell a story. I'm not saying it's easy to make a good film, but if you're duende, is now encouraged. No, you have all these platforms. When I was learning film. The only way to get your film noticed was to bring it to a festival. And in those days, you know, your, your, your roll of film would be about this big. And then you'd have made a pile of that big. You'd have to send it by air freight. And then you'd have to pass through customs. Before the selection committee can look at your, at your film to choose it for that festival, Wow, it's a big production number. You have to be a millionaire to do that. But I think now with all these platforms, with YouTube, with the ease that with which you can make those shots and still ask your question at the same time, my God, bravo. Uh, you're going to be, it's going to, I, I welcome that. As a matter of fact, I have had to, to uh, combine video with some of my film actual film shots, no? That film that you saw now, the first part was like a silent film. It's flickering, that's really came from 16 millimeter film. The shot 35 years later by an old man looking for rocks along the sea, that's with video. Now you can combine it and you don't have to have all those pitfalls of trying to deal with 16 millimeter film. You know, in old days you have to refrigerate the film. Film, what else you, you had to then you would you couldn't now after you do your shot you can look again and hey why is kid let me out of focus and, am I, maybe sometimes I sound like I'm out of focus <laughs> but uh, you, you see you see it immediately before we would have to still send our film to the laboratory and wait one or two weeks before we would see our rushes now so yeah it's a welcome development but it's more welcome, not because of the instantaneity, but because you and you and you and your duendes can can play with the medium. Thank you. Okay. Why uh, why uh, kid latte? <laughs> why kid latte? Why not? Uh, um, <laughs> actually, young kid latte was just the name I gave to the principal character in Perfume Nightmare, no? Uh, the jeepney driver. I don't know. I was just thinking. Somehow that name came. It was, It. It sounded like a contradiction. Or what was the word? Omic Omicron. No. Oxymoron. Oxymoron. Huh? Oxymoron. 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 Okay. So it's like that. Apparently, it sounds like it is a contradiction. But actually, Kidlat Hemig is. Kidlat is the flash. Kulog. <laughs> It's the sound. So, if you don't have a flash, it's really not a, a contradiction. Um, maybe over the years, uh, it became it became a, uh, a kind of a spiritual goal for me now, just to be a, a flash, to be to try to become liwanag, to try to share. Uh, with the young people 
not that I'm a genius, but that I maybe whatever experiences I have to help them also open their doing this to seeing that. <laughs> when you nurture doing it's first you recognize who is that unique storyteller in you, and what are the kinds of stories that your uh, duende would like to tell. Alam niyo, when I was teaching a uh, uh, film at the UP in the 80s, no? uh, I would start the class with, okay, eto na, the first three weeks walang pasok. Everybody pull out your own, um, pull out your video camera and make a five minuter so that I know what you want or what you, what you want to do in this course. And let's meet in three weeks or in one month, and let's have a let's look at everybody's five minute. And when we would show the films on that one month later, all their five minuters. Yeah, I don't think you should be surprised, but 85 to 90 percent of these little student productions had sex, a gang rape, a bang bang bang, a kidnapping, a police action, etc. And that was a nice start for the semester. No? Okay, are these the, the kind of stories you want to tell? Or are these the kind of stories you think the establishment wants you to tell, to make money? And if, the, if these are the kinds of films that the establishment is going to make money on, are you, not going, to, are you going to muffle your duendes voice just to make something that will make profits for them? How about your own social profit? I'm happy because my duende told its story. Sayang naman. And even if your audience is not the millions that go to the cineplexes, you had maybe 40 or 50 or 150 people who went to see your, your duende's story. Lakayin ba kayo, di ba? Hindi pstyon, pero your thrilling duende made a impression on other people, so why not? So once you recognize your your duende and you look at your childhood and say, oh, kaya pala I have stamp collections. I was an avid stamp collector when I was a kid. Or here, like in, in this film, I, I really, whenever I go to the beach, I look for very unique stones. So it became, uh, and I noticed one time we were in Iloilo and there was this it was near the mouth of a volcano, and all the stones blue had like maps on them. So these things come into my story, and I let them. So look for your duende, find out how you picked up certain interests when you were a kid, what was the culture you grew up in, and then when you recognize, ah, kaya pala yung duende ko ganito. Maybe you can nurture it or even guide it a little bit more. But the strength comes because it's something you're very familiar with. And you know, that's, the word, what's the word, that's what the world is waiting for. Your, your unique duende story. They're not waiting for Star Wars 12 <laughs> or Men in Black 221. Or, or Harrison, I was at Indiana Jones, 2,850 They're looking for your unique duende story number one. And then you'll wonder why. But I'm not talking about producers. I'm talking about there are people who, are, who want to resonate with your duende for some reason or another. Now, it's becoming part of culture because our kids are exposed. I mean, I have a nephew and I don't. He's so interested in military history. He goes to with his father and he wants to see the the military museum, the naval museum, and he likes to buy as many toys and I don't know where it comes from. But that's just to answer your question, it, it, it is becoming a part because we were exposed to it a lot, but maybe that's where the responsibility of the independent filmmakers is to say, hey, there are other stories to tell. And why are those gun stories so easy to sell? It's just, it's, 
it's the combination of sensational sounds, boom, 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 and and the music goes ta da 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 You know, we we get conditioned to these kinds of uh, well, I call it MacDog films. <laughs> um, it's, it's just a formula that we got used to in our taste. Now people, when they see a poster with the, with a gun like that, <laughs> they, they buy a ticket. We have to. Be, I think we start by being aware of our habits, of what are we consuming. I'm not talk, I'm talking less about consumption. It is about actually being part of your life and actually trying to tell a story that has a lot of these elements. In well, it. okay, that's right. So, so a lot of the uh, films we, we consume are have violence mm -hmm. because that is the that's the mainstream formula. It's the one that gets into the malls. They won't show my films because I don't have any violence. They won't show my film because I don't have any rape scenes in it, you know? Now, I'm talking about the cycle, and uh, maybe, is it too late? Are we already becoming a violent culture because, and cruel culture because of that? Okay, let's go back. Just one little thing that maybe, I mentioned this before in other talks. If our films would talk about a very strong Filipino value on it, which I'd like to share with you now, okay? Because it may be, we, we have it. Um, okay. About 30 years ago, uh, a professor in UP said, why are we analyzing Filipinos? He was a psychology doctor. Why are we analyzing Filipinos through Sigmund Freud through Carl Jung, through the rats, experimental rats of Skinner. Why don't we find our own methodology based on really Filipino core values as a starting point? And the result of that is when they, after a few years of research, they came up with what is now called Kapwa psychology. Uh, you're all familiar with the word Kapwa, no? Kapwa is a Filipino orientation where the self includes the other. I am as a person, but I don't think only of me. I include about I include my Kapwa people, uh, fellow people. Yung pakiipag Kapwa natin is a strong orientation that people have in this part of the world. It can get lost because with industrialization, industrialization makes us compete with one another. We, sinasabong tayo. And because in the end, the industrial culture is about economics and therefore we are all fighting for the same job. Hey, we're friends, man. Wow, pare, pero, I know you're after my job and I'm after your job, so hanggang dyan lang. So this creates borders, no? Now, I'm mentioning this, but are there films about this side of Filipinos? It's nice to make a film about uh, all these massacres that Carlo Caparas makes films about. And yes, they're the truth. They'll say, but I'm only telling the truth. It happened. The, the, the Ampatuan massacre, it's, it's true, and it's, I want to do it. Because it makes a lot of money. But I want to do it, it's the truth. So, uh, the momentum, because the institutions have created a product called the movie or film, which is a commodity to sell, that becomes the theme of any story. That's why I talk to young filmmakers and artists. Hey, let your Salili tell your stories. Mother Lily may not pick it up. ABS-CBN may not pick it up. But anyway, let's get out those stories about the other side of the Philippines. I mean, yeah, violence is a, is a part. And it's becoming more and more a part because it's, it's, it's entering our living rooms with every other story about even the motorcycle violence 
somebody just strips on his motorcycle and he has blood and he's, oh, I have my 15 minutes of fame. And that was a <laughs> yeah. um, All I'm saying is that the media has their dynamics and because it's, 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 it's economy driven, it's money driven. And maybe we, the only way to change that is, and I think that's happening with internet. No? There are a lot of new dialogues coming in because of this new media. And maybe this is also a chance for, uh, why do we always have to let the Hollywood formula be the only story that's being told? Just because the so-called captains of industry, the, the big financiers uh, want to make so much money and therefore this is the, they play safe and, and play only the movies that have a hundred rapes and murders in it. I think it's more, I don't know, if I had, <laughs> if I were a revolutionary, I would probably try to dynamite all the TV stations. <laughs> Sorry, I hope some of the <laughs> benefactors of this real thing. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, uh, I'm just uh, exaggerating. I'm to say that this, maybe these things are, are, are also moving, new movements, because it's able, we're able to the internet to to bring these energies together. Maybe it won't be as, you know, when I, in seven, 1977, when I came out in my first film, Perfume Nightmare, I was alone. I was the only indie at the moment, at that moment, who was somehow there. Now we have Filipino guys and, and and women filmmakers winning awards in all the major film festivals. So, and I think it's because their duende is able to tell a unique story. Well, okay, there's some indies who also still unknowingly have to have something sexy or something uh, spicy or, or angry in the film. Um, but there's something the way they treat it that, that the people outside take notice. So let's 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 find out what are those strengths that we have and let's let it come out in our stories and our, our films. And I think that maybe that's why at 75 I'm still <laughs> uh, trying to be optimist. I've never been offered by the industry to do a film. But it's okay because I think if I would do a film for Mother <laughs> Lily, would you have even if she would let me have my way, but just to have a hundred army mm. around you, the cameraman and his allies, the mm. caterer and her allies, the costume, a whole 100 people, and I'm so used to working with three people, I probably have a heart attack. <laughs> But sooner or later, I think, if we just keep on going, and I think if more when they start to contact each other and give some strength to each other, it's going to, it's going to it'll happen. I like to work with uh, self-taught artists. I have nothing against going to fine art school, but I think the, the duende of a... Uh, artist who doesn't go to film school it has a much more leeway to come out with its its framing, its duende framing. Uh, sometimes when you go to, like if you go to film school, they'll tell you, oh, you should always uh, put a tripod, oh, you must always have this kind of a framing, uh, you must never let a panning shot go into a zoom shot. There are all these kinds of, and there, just somebody made a rule and then it became a rule. It's not, it's not a, it didn't come from, <laughs> from the gods or from, uh, from some kind of uh, Ten Commandments. It was really just, uh, some, it, it sometimes become a convention that a painting has to look like this, or that an insulation should have this or that. The most important thing is that there is a spark that comes out from your work. 
whether it's a film or whether it's a uh, a painting, that spark of your duende is the one that will hit the duende also of the one who's looking at your work. And you don't know why, but they get excited. And sometimes that excitement is 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 is, is affected by if you have too much um, uh, education towards the fineness of your art no? or the fineness of your film all your shots should have a very similar texture and that there must be the grains have to be the same so and hollywood has created a lot of these rules and that's why it's almost difficult for anybody who wants to tell a very simple story to to, to tell his story because you know whenever i make a story i, I don't realize it but sometimes i'm my head is really getting insecure because I'm trying to outdo um, uh, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> if I was trying to do outdo George Lucas, you know, here I'm doing this little playful space film. The, if, if the moment I start thinking, how did George Lucas do that shot? How did he create that illusion of, of, of space travel? Then I start competing with George Lucas. And the moment I start competing with George Lucas, then I cannot make a yo-yo film that's playful like this. Because the standards are set by those very popular blockbusters. Now, George Lucas has become a god before Star Wars space films. I think I'm playing also a little I'm playing, I'm, I'm mocking in any way the kind of super budget films like Star Wars by making my own third world cheap, cheapo film. So in this way, art doesn't depend. We have to ask which voice is saying that this is art and this is not art. If George Lucas will tell me, your film is not a film, I'll say, says you. I have some friends who think it's an artwork. You're not, you're not, you're not the god I'm going to say, okay. So I think we, we, we have to let, we have to be confident that if the art comes from our duende, it will, it, it has its own claim to art. We're in the world today where everything is decided by international uh, art connoisseurs or international film critics, and they know everything, and they can cite every reason why your film is bullshit. Maybe sometimes, I'm not saying that we should ignore a critic, but I'm just saying sometimes healthy criticism is good, but if they ignore your film just because it doesn't have that finesse, that fine archness, or that fine film institute look, uh, you should always check a second opinion or a third opinion because I, I think they're not gods that we have to listen to. Art is for everybody and it will, it will, it will make its mark and I think that's, that's the final mark. It, 